Hi everyone, uh, welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Sarah Modrod and this is my first YouTube video ever. So what I wanna be doing in this clip is introducing myself, giving a bit of background on who I am and what are the topics that I currently teach and also just pave the way on what I am expecting to do on this YouTube channel. So if you don't know me, my name is Sarah Modrod again, and I'm currently on the faculty at the University of Southern California. I am a lecturer and I have two faculty appointments, one in the School of Engineering and one in the School of Medicine. But before I dive into what I currently do, I, I wanna go back a few years and discuss where um, my teaching career began. And that was at the California Institute of Technology um, back in 2015, I started to partner with a professor in um, the chemistry and chemical engineering de department or division, and his name is um, Mark Davis. And so Mark and I um, began collaborating together and we put together this course called Social Media for Scientists. And I think it was really just an amazing opportunity for us to bring our expertise, which are very different, um, to this class and make something that's very impactful and help students as they prepare for their careers in STEM. So my expertise and my background is in communications. Um, I did my undergraduate degree at Boston University and I completed my master's at Northeastern University and that was in organizational communications and I specialized in social media and online communities. So um, this course we put together, um, it, it was important to have somebody like me providing perspective and um, developing these case studies on social media, but it was also incredibly useful and vital to its success to have somebody like Mark, who has um, had a very successful and established career in science. So um, he, he's a chemical engineer and he has, uh, he's been very successful. And what's been most interesting about Mark is he has been in every single type of um, scenario where you can imagine that communication and communicating effectively would be very important. So to give you a few examples, he's um, given congressional testimonies, he's done TED Talks, um, he's given talks to thousands of people, and in all of these cases, communication played a very important role. So when you think about traditional courses that come out of um, college, uh, colleges of journalism and communications, um, they, they tend to be put together by people like myself with backgrounds in communication, and when they're aimed at audiences in STEM, it's very rare that um, STEM professionals and scientists are actually engaged and uh, I work with um, communicators on developing courses. Quite often what happens is these communication courses are put on and um, literature and communication majors are the one who are creating it, so they, they look at these situations and say, this is what I think a STEM professional will need in their um, careers to be successful. So um, when we developed this course, it was very important that both of us provide um, input and perspective. So he, he really wanted to help students to be effective communicators in ways that will really enhance their careers. And one of the elements that Mark thought about was um, the importance of digital communication. So he has um, increasingly had to prepare for um, engagements with um, over Skype, for instance, or he a few years ago had a, a situation where he was um, communicating very sim similar to a, um, a Reddit AMA where it was just very, um, it was a few hours and he was responding to questions from people all over the world. And those types of scenarios are gonna become more and more common as we become a more digitalized and globalized society. So um, he really felt that that was the, the third com component in communication that has really been missing. 
um, technical communication, written communication, and oral communication have all been pretty standard in a um, STEM student's education. It was this digital component that has so far been missing. So we, we came up with this course, and um, the way that I approached developing the curriculum was to first and foremost have an understanding of how STEM professionals were using social media. And we decided on social media specifically because everybody is on some form of social media today. It's very rare that you encounter somebody, especially a young person, who does not have an online presence. So um, since students are using this technology, we thought it would be very important to um, engage them on it and also um, have them improve their current online presence so that it actually enhances their, um, um, their applications when it comes time to looking for a, um, a, a faculty position or going into industry. So, as I said, I, I looked into how current STEM professionals are using social media and it's just it's absolutely fascinating. Each platform has its own community and each field and discipline within STEM also has their own approach to using all of these different spaces. So, um, for instance, if you look at Reddit, our science is incredibly popular and you can get a mix of people who are science enthusiasts, you can get um, scientists who are very established in their field, um, undergraduates, graduate students, and they are all um, discussing topics that are important in their fields. But um, I think that sub has something like 17 million subscribers to it. Um, so the, the range and the quality of the discussions can vary significantly. Um, if you then look at different social media platforms like Twitter or look into blogging, things like that, you, you start to see how some of these discussions um, can become more specialized and really focus around um, specific issues, specific disciplines, and um, you know students who are, who are still in their education versus um, you know different platforms, like I said. So, in going through all that and reviewing um, how social media is being used and how the public is using social media, some, um, some themes really started to emerge for me. And when I looked at those themes, that's where I started to build out uh, what this course would look like. So um, some of the themes that I had been seeing were um, conducting outreach, so scientists who are engaging the public, um, and in reach, which is scientist to scientist, expert to expert. Um, and then there were, there were some really interesting cases that were emerging with um, crisis and also social media and the law. So just to give you a few examples of what these case studies typically look like, um, I wanted to run through a couple of examples for you. So in the case of in reach, I, um, I found this professor, Lior Pachter, who um, is a computational biologist, and the work that he had been doing on, on social media had just been so fascinating to me that um, though he's at Caltech now, at the time when I had um, learned about his online presence, he was at um, uh, UC Berkeley. So. I actually I flew up to Berkeley to meet with him and hear more about what his motivations were for um, putting together these just impressive and fantastic blog entries about um, his field and um, and just learn more about his activity on Twitter as well. So I had been developing a case on him in particular around a, um, a specific blog entry that he had posted back in 2013. And in this blog entry, um, he wrote that uh, GTEx was throwing away 90% of it, their data. And so that's, um, that's a, a headline that is really an attention grabber. And he, what he had found in this case was that the way that data was being analyzed and interpreted was um, they were using some, um, some faulty methods. And in doing so, it was jeopardizing the, uh, the output and the quality of the information that um, they were reviewing. And this was an important case because the funding behind this was coming from the NIH. And 
um, it was millions of dollars. So this blog entry was incredibly important because it um, immediately grabbed attention and the people who were on the GTEx consortium responded um, within 24 hours of him putting this post out. And so when they responded, um, they did so in the comment se section of his blog. And conversation also moved over to Twitter where he was engaging other researchers that were involved in the study. And the reason why I think this is important and impactful is because um, if you look at traditional ways that um, scientists typically engage one another, um, it, it's through the peer review process. So if, if this were a peer reviewed study, and it was um, it had been published. The, the the odds and the likelihood of getting such an extensive and immediate response from um, a reader are um, it, it's a mixed bag, you know. So an editor an editor could look at that and say um, that they didn't want to respond to a comment from somebody like Lear Pactor, or a corresponding author, for instance, may have an inbox that's just overloaded with messages, so they may not even um, notice that. But if you, if you get your message out on social media and you do so in a very professional um, manner, then it can, it, can at it can attract the attention of the right people. And this was something that I wasn't really seeing back in 2015, 2016 when I, w I was looking at InReach. So to find this case and to see that this is somebody who had been doing this consistently in terms of um, conducting InReach and engaging his, um, his network um, within his field was just, it was just, it was like finding a gold mine. It was, I was so excited. So I went up and I met him and he talked extensively about um, why he's participating in this, and he said that it's important because, um, you know, it, it, we need in in science we we need to make sure that the information that's being published is not only um, correct but it, it's reproducible. So um, that's that's also been a theme and an issue within STEM in general, and. Um, I, I found it really important that somebody like him at his stage of his career was um, being the source of these um, these comments and starting these conversations because it's really important for younger generations to see um, faculty, tenured faculty, being invested in making sure that science is sound and credible. And so he, um, he's since moved down to Caltech and is on the faculty there. Um, and what's been so great about teaching this course is I, um, I've been seeing an uptick in the number of students who each semester have recognized Lior Pachter because of the work that he's currently doing on um, Bits of DNA's blog and then also on Twitter. So um, students are paying attention. They're, they're looking to faculty to see what their activity is and they're making judgments based off of that. And, um, how they will choose to engage their own peers. Um, and so, let's see, another case that I do in the course, uh, it focuses on outreach, and there's no better organization that conducts meaningful scientific outreach than NASA. And um, so I'm very lucky to have a connection over at NASA JPL. And um, so Veronica McGregor, who is a, the social media lead, has given a guest lecture in my course a couple times now. And she's described the strategy and the approaches that um, NASA takes to um, using their social media platforms and um, profiles to have very engaging and exciting um, activities and strategies on um, their uh, various uh, approaches. So it's if you a few examples more specifically, if you think about the um, the Mars rovers, the the Twitter account that they had was extremely successful. It was fun. It was exciting. And that was because they developed these um, this persona that was attached to it. And Veronica was the one who came up with that very clever idea. She said to herself, um, how are we gonna get this information out there? How are we gonna keep our audience engaged? I know, let's go ahead and add personality and make this account first person. So it's the rover who's on Mars and he's telling us about his experience. And it just, it 
it's clever things like that that people can use to um, get the public excited about science. And um, so we really deep dive into that. But also this course, I think, is just an excellent opportunity to come up with creative and clever assignments. Um, and I've, I've had a lot of success and I've really enjoyed seeing what students develop um, using these social media platforms. So uh, one assignment that I have that um, the graduate students typically find to be um, the most difficult, but also um, hopefully the most fun is on Twitter. I, uh, I have the students all condense their research down into one tweet and they can, um, uh, at the time when I started this assignment, um, Twitter had 140 characters. So it was very, very, they had to be very, very concise with their words. And not only that, um, they, uh, they had to describe their research in a way that somebody like me, um, someone outside their field and discipline could understand. And I allowed them to um, upload an, an image with that text, so long it was, as it was their um, own original um, photo. So I had students, each semester I taught this, tell me that they felt that this was the most difficult and most challenging um, assignment that they had at Caltech, which to me uh, feels, feels like quite the accomplishment because it's some of the most uh, brilliant students and brilliant scientists in the world who are at Caltech and to challenge them on that level, um, I think is, uh, it was pretty exciting. So another assignment that I do is I have students um, conduct edits on Wikipedia and I know that Wikipedia is usually something that we, we frown upon in academia, but it's actually a tremendous tool for um, teaching students how to, um, how to write and to write well in a neutral tone. So Wikipedia Education is a nonprofit that um, is just incredible. They, are, they provide free resources and um, a free dashboard to faculty who are using their platform to um, expand or create assignments in their courses. So every semester I have this Wikipedia assignment and the way that I do it is I have students um, select from a, a list that I put together um, of, of different articles that they can choose to improve. And I come up with that list by taking a look at what their majors are. And um, I review Wikipedia pages that are within their majors and I find pages that could use um, substantial improvement to them. And in this assignment, what they do is they improve existing references, create new references, um, edit articles and add new content to them as well. And throughout the assignment, they are also responsible for engaging the Wikipedia community um, and the other editors through um, talk pages. So it, it's really quite incredible to see the outputs that come from this and also their ability to work and interact with um, an online community. And I always like to throw some zingers in this assignment and students are usually up for the challenge. Um, so I don't always provide just a list of um, articles that need substantial improvement. I will also throw in some articles that um, are, are very complex and already very well developed. And usually a student is up for the task to um, improve those pages. And so one such example is for a few semesters, I was including um, CRISPR to this assignment. And I had one student who was a biomedical engineering major and he decided to edit CRISPR and his edits were quite good. They were, um, they were very advanced and they actually stayed on the page for a long time. Um, so it wasn't like it was completely reverted and removed. And so his page, his edits received over 2 million views. And if you think about that in the bigger context of assignments and um, impact, it, it's quite substantial. I don't know of any other platform or there any other time in history where a student has been able to have their written work be accessed and viewed by two million people. That just hasn't happened before, but um, social media and Wikipedia have made it completely possible. But 
also if you think about what a traditional writing assignment is like in in college you as a student will submit something and it will be graded and reviewed by one person the professor and then um, if you're lucky maybe a ta will also see it but other than that um you know you, you get your grade you get your assignment and that um that paper gets tucked away in some file on a laptop and that's the end of it but with social media you get your work seen by um hundreds, thousands, millions of people. And um, oftentimes the students at the end of the semester when we go through and I show them the metrics on, uh, on their work, they're, they're very excited and they're very proud of the contributions they've made. And I think from a societal perspective, having students do those updates on Wikipedia is important because they're sharing knowledge with people who may not have access to higher education like um, they currently have. So there's a lot of layers to an assignment like that that I think are really important to consider. And um, that's why now I cringe when I see faculty saying, oh, you're using Wikipedia in your course. Um, but I think that stereotype is starting to be removed when people see the value of it and what can be done um, to improve these pages in this online resource that all of us use. Um, so let's see. So when I left Caltech and moved to USC, um, I brought my course with me and I currently teach it in uh, the School of Engineering. Uh, the course has since been, since been updated to Social Media for Scientists and Engineers. And what I love about it as an instructor is each semester I teach it, it changes significantly because um, social media cases, they, they need constant updating. And in some cases, I completely just replace um, content with new and emerging um, um, ideas and, and cases that are more relevant to what's been happening lately. So um, the course is never the same. And I'll say that when I first started um, teaching this in 2016, I, I had misinformation as, as maybe not even its own section. It was just a, a blip, it was a snippet. But over the last few years, that's changed significantly. We now deal with misinformation and disinformation um, campaigns that are, are very targeted and very, very problematic. So that's an area that has been expanding significantly and um, has been important to discuss in the course. And a way that I approach that is I, I'm, I have a section where I teach students about online misinformation and how it spreads and why it spreads. And then I also expand upon that and show how difficult it is to actually combat that misinformation. And the way that I do that is through a online Twitter exercise where um, I, I use that as a way to get students comfortable with using Twitter. And the first few questions are um, having them um, answer questions about the readings, but then I close out the exercise and say, debunk this, the moon is made of cheese. And what every student ends up doing in that case is they pull up NASA. They say, here's what NASA says the moon is made of, and this is why it's not made of cheese. But what they don't prepare for, or they don't realize, is that not everybody looks to NASA or these trusted, reputable sources as um, being trustworthy. And that tends to be the case with um, people who are anti-science or engage in science denialism. So when they, they say, here's what NASA says, I say, I don't believe in NASA. Um, and the conversation tends to shut down at that point. But really that's what we're dealing with when we have um, these online encounters with folks who are anti-science because if they don't believe in the same sources that we do and um, they don't see them as credible, so where do you go with that conversation? And after this Twitter exercise I have with the students, it, it really opens up um, some very interesting discussions on how we should be um, having those conversations and if it, if it is even possible to be debunking misinformation and changing views um, via social media. So um, really interesting stuff comes out of that and um, I'm, I'm really thrilled and happy to be continuing to teach that course. Um, another area that has been very important to me in the last few years is in medicine. Um, so when I moved over to USC, um, 
the former dean of, um, of medicine, he learned about what I would be doing down in engineering and he said, I want that up here in medicine. So I was recruited to, um, to teach um, communication workshops and modules to medical students at um, each year of their, their education and training. And I, I approached developing those, um, those lessons plans the same way that I did in developing social media for scientists, which was to go online and really understand the space and understand the conversations that were occurring. And what I found um, immediately, this was back in 2017, um, was on, on Instagram. I saw behavior from um, medical professionals and medical students who were partnering with uh, these different companies to be promoting and offering sponsored posts. And sometimes they were receiving free products as a result of um, these um, these these sponsored posts and other times the um, the connection wasn't clearly established so I, I found a few of these paid medical influencers early on and into my um, reviewing and I um, followed them and used their presence as teaching tools in these uh, workshops I conducted with first-year medical students so it, it was really wonderful because I've had access to medical students in ways that I think has been very unique. Um, for the first year students, I have had them for two and a half to three hours and I've developed these, um, these workshops that presents some of these, um, the, these ethical gray areas and social media gray areas that typically aren't discussed. What I've found is that um, medical students and students in general are very, they're very savvy. They've been on social media for um, a long time and so they've had um, teachers parents um, tell them for years you know don't post anything unprofessional and so if you go into a session and try and teach um, a medical student about um, you know if you keep it basic and say don't post anything unprofessional they will roll their eyes at you and say okay we got this but if you present them with um, actual examples of behavior that could be perceived as questionable um, unethical or um, as having no issues whatsoever, that's really where the interesting conversations start to happen. Because um, more often than not, places like the AMA, um, they, they have guidelines on professional behavior, but they don't really get into the weeds on some of this activity. So if you put students in the driver's seat to come to their own conclusions about what professional, what is professional and unprofessional behavior, the outcomes are just, they're fascinating. Um, some of the ways that I approach this topic with uh, medical influencers is to present them with cases that show different products and different types of um, sponsored posts and endorsements. So for instance, um, if you have a medical professional who is wearing scrubs and the, those scrubs were given to them for free, if they are on social media posting about said scrubs and um, as, as a way to um, encourage and promote um, purchase, purchasing of this, um, this certain brand, then is that considered unethical if the disclosures are clearly made and it shows that um, this this relationship with that company is very apparent um, and is that problematic or is it not problematic because you think about the target the target audience for that um, that content it's not the general public it's other medical professionals but if you take something say say like this which is hydro rx and it's from the um, the the company rave doctor um and you have influencers that are posting about this and these are influencers who are attending raves and music festivals um is that something that is considered unethical um what about if a medical professional is holding the product and they are wearing a white coat um are there issues with that so um these are just a few examples of the the cases and um methods i have for teaching about these topics um I think by bringing them to students and having them assess and determine for their own um, benefit what is and what is unprofessional, um, it, it gets these conversations going with their peers. And 
what I found is that after teaching um, over 200 students at this point that they tend to reach a consensus on what is professional and what isn't professional and they start to have a very um, they start to have ownership over those feelings and really want the best for themselves as individuals but then also the best for um, medical professionals and the medical industry overall and I think it's important to do that because what we've been seeing recently in the media is these isolated incidents where people have been behaving poorly on social media but um, overwhelmingly um, students and medical professionals they really want to be putting out good content and content that represents their field in a very positive manner and I that's why I think it's important to have these um, these trainings because we really need to be teaching people how to do this in a professional manner and empowering them to do so. And that's completely possible when you open up the avenue for these discussions to take place. And so um, in their second year, I have them again in these small groups and I've developed curriculum on how to navigate these um, digital boundaries. So. What should you do if a, a, a colleague, um, a peer, or an attending physician wants to add you on your social media page? And so what sort of um, opportunities and consequences can result from that? Um, how about when you throw in um, patients into the mix? So I, I like to present them with different opportunities to have, or different scenarios. And an interesting case is telling them that you are taking a patient history and um, they they have their consultation and eight hours later um, they are um, the the medical professional is at home and all of a sudden their phone buzzes and they see that they have a new message on Facebook Messenger and it turns out that it's this patient from uh, earlier in the day and this person has reached out saying hi doctor I just wanted to let you know that I gave you an inaccurate um, list of medications. Here's two other medications that I'm currently on. What do you do in that case? Um, they've just opened up a new line of communication with you. Do you acknowledge it? Do you respond? Um, what do you do with the information that they've just provided you? Um, social media is starting to complicate these relationships and um, between medical care providers and, and patients. They, they now have incredible access in ways that just simply wasn't available before. So we look at situations like that and in their third year, I have them for an hour and it's all 185 to 200 of them. And so what I do in that one hour time block is go through and really um, revisit some of these concepts, but then we also start to discuss reputation management. And the, the big concern that most medical professionals have is with uh, Yelp reviews. So a Yelp review can make or break a physician's career and it, it's, it must be very frustrating to see um, one-star reviews that are um, focusing on things that maybe um, aren't too important um, to the actual care that's being provided. Um, so there, there have been plenty of cases recently that have emerged of medical professionals um, blasting back on these Yelp reviews. And in those cases, it's been unprofessional behavior, but it's also been violating HIPAA because uh, what ends up happening is they, um, they post these responses that say, I just wanted to let you know that I'm correcting the record for anybody else who's reading this. But in doing so, they've, um, they've acknowledged that um, this person has been a patient of theirs. In some cases, they've gone through and provided extensive amount of details on when the patient came in, what follow-up visits happened, and what was happening in those appointments. And so that can be very damaging, and it can also op open up um, lawsuits. And um, so that's something that we see just so commonly um, a few months ago, I wanted to, I went on Yelp and I wanted to check uh, just to see how many I could find in 30 minutes. And so I created a, a, a Twitter thread on this. And in that 30 minutes, I found seven cases and they were just as I described in great, great detail. Um, and the medical professional overindulged and over, over described um, 
what the interaction had been with the patient. So want to make people aware of those um, those situations and also encourage them to think about whether or not these are the things, the types of posts they should respond to. And if they do want to respond, um, providing them guidance on how to do so without um, necessarily acknowledge, acknowledging that that patient has ever been seen by um, that physician. And there's, way to, there's ways to do this. So um, I hope if anybody's watching this and they are, are concerned and would like to follow up, um, I, I would be happy to share some tips because I, I know how important this is. Um, but, and then in their, their fourth and final year, I've been developing um, more specialized uh, uh, short courses that they can be taking remotely while they are um, conducting interviews um, offsite. So it, it's been really an incredible journey up until this point, and I've loved teaching students, um, undergrad, graduate students, medical students um, at Caltech and USC. And I'm currently teaching a short course for the USC Caltech MD-PhD program. Um, once again, Mark Davis and I have partnered together on this and I've been doing um, the, the modules that are dedicated to um, communication and he's been covering things like how to um, how to establish your first lab um, and um, how to be a good mentor things that um, currently aren't being taught in other programs so we have really tried to identify where some of these knowledge gaps are and um, when we partner together and it's been um, an incredible experience so far and I just want to say thank you to everybody here on YouTube and then also on Twitter. I have loved engaging all of you and hearing your different perspectives on what constitutes professional and unprofessional behavior and just how this technology is um, changing the landscape of both science and medicine. So I, I hope that you'll stick around and watch some of my other videos and please contact me in the comments or on Twitter if you would like me to deep dive into any specific topics. Thanks so much.